Good morning, church. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. So if we serve a great God, how great is he? He's worthy of all our praise. So if we serve a great God, who should we be imitating? Amen. Back in December, I had the opportunity to preach on the first book of Corinthians chapter 4, and we're going to go back there today. The Lord gave me this word quite a while ago, and I've struggled finding words to bring the message God wanted me to speak to you guys today. It has brought a conviction over me. I really couldn't figure out until this morning what was the problem. While I was lying in bed this morning struggling on what lacked in this sermon, I rolled over and just said, I don't know what's going on. And Kim said, maybe you're an imposter. And that was hard for me to hear. But that shouldn't have been a revelation because I'm only human. God calls us to be imitators of his son, the holy of holies. And the Holy Spirit again said to me, I'm not telling you to ask the people here today anything. I'm asking you to ask yourself, who are you? Are you an imposter or are you an imitator? Who do you think you are? Let's pray. Lord, I know you didn't call me today because I'm able. I know that you called me because you enabled me to be here today, Lord. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your conviction, Lord, that ever so sweet, tender correction that you bring us, Lord. You love us when we are unlovable. You are good when we are bad. I praise you, Lord, for who you are and what you do for us, Lord. And I repent, Lord, for those things I do that grieve you. I just pray today, Lord, that you use me in a way that only you can. Lord, I pray that as eyes look forward, they don't see me, that they see you, Lord, in me. You are calling us to be your children. You are telling us that we are supposed to be imitators of you. It seems like something that we'll never obtain, and we may never, but I long to be as close to you as I can. I just praise you today, Lord. I pray for the words that come out of my mouth, Lord. I pray that you guard my tongue of anything that's not supposed to be said and bring forth any words, Lord, that I'm missing, Lord. I pray for every ear to hear the message that you speak to them today, Lord. We just thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for... I didn't hear Phil thank anybody for the snow, but we have to be grateful for what we get. Lord, so we just thank you for all that you do for us. Amen. I'm going to start today in the book of 1 Corinthians again. We're going to start out in chapter 4. In this piece of scripture, Paul is writing this letter to Timothy in regards to the Corinthian church. After spending 18 months in Corinth setting up this church, he moved on to set up churches throughout Ephesus and Macedonia. Macedonia. (laughs) And in transition, he got word that there were problems going on in the church. So right away, we can see that Paul was already doing what he was supposed to do, being an imitator. He's doing exactly what Jesus commanded him to do in Matthew 28, where he says, go out and make disciples of all nations. In this letter, he was addressing some of the issues that the church has been dealing with since his departure. The church has fallen away from many of the values that made them Christ-like. They were falling into their own sinful ways. This was making them imposters rather than imitators. Let's jump forward. If you could turn with me to 1 Corinthians 4, 14.
14. <clears throat> I do not write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For if you were to have countless tutors in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers. For in Jesus Christ, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I exhort you, be imitators of me. For this reason, I have sent you Timothy, who is my beloved faithful child in the Lord, and he will remind you of the ways which are in Christ, just as I teach everywhere in every church. Imitator or imposter? The title of the sermon is Imitator or Imposter. In these verses, Paul is making a plea to the church to get back to the values that they all once held dear. He's not coming to condemn the church, but he's coming with a loving heart. He's sp speaking truth and love, and that's who Jesus is. Be an imitator of me. He says that. I imitate Christ. You imitate me. In 1 Corinthians 18, it goes on to say, Now some of you have become arrogant, as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you soon if the Lord wills, and I shall find out not the words of those who are arrogant, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in words, but in power. When Paul is writing these few verses, he acknowledges that it's not coming from any human man but from the power of the Holy Spirit. And then he throws up this question, shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? What do you desire? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? In the first sermon, I pointed out what Pastor Ron Sr. noted in the Academy study of the book of 1 Corinthians. And he says, the remarkable thing about the Corinthian church is not that the congregation had problems. It is that there were not more problems. Carved by the Holy Spirit from the most corrupt city in the Roman Empire, the Corinthians were a composite of people from every point of the spectrum, of every human sin and depravity. It's not much different than what our church is today. And I'm not just calling out our church and the Church of America. I'm going to ask you to ponder these questions today. What does it look like to you to be an imitator? What does it look like to be an imposter? Imitator or imposter? I don't need much help to figure out what it looks like to be an imitator. In my flesh, I walk as an imitator, as an imposed imposter. The part I struggle with is being an imitator. What does it look like to be an imitator? In the second half of chapter 6, Paul says, be an imitator of me. That might be a little confusing because all the way through the New Testament we are told to be an imitator of Christ. So to understand how Paul can actually say this, let's go back a bit to the ninth chapter of the book of Acts where we get Luke's third person narrative of the conversion of Saul to Paul. In Acts 9, number 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord, the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus, so that he found, if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether man or woman, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice to him saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? This next verse in chapter here in verse 5 is really interesting to me. He says, who are you, Lord? Saul, who's out persecuting Christians, wants to take him prisoner and even kill him, knows that this is the Lord speaking to him through a revelation. Saul asked, I am Jesus, 
whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sounds, but they didn't see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could not see a thing. So they led him by hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind, did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on State Street and ask for a man from Taurus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hand on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias said, I have heard many reports about this man and all of the harm that he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer in my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hand on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you might see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and he was baptized. In this little bit of scripture, we see the example of what we would consider Saul, who would soon become Paul, as an imposter. Saul was dead set on imprisoning or killing anyone known to be a follower or imitator of Jesus. He became an imitator, an imitator through a revelation straight from Jesus. If anyone has the right to say, follow me, I would say that would be Paul. Then we find our friends and we want to imitate them. So become an, <clears throat> so become an imitator of Christ should be a simple conversion, right? Wrong. Becoming an imitator of Christ is not just tweaking a few bad habits or eliminating some of our vocabulary, not even close. New friends and attend church regularly on Sundays. These are steps in the right direction, but just a few, it's just the tip of the iceberg. Paul also gives us the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 and 23 to, to help walk in the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against, against such things, there is no law. To be an imitator, we must surround our life. We must surrender our lives. We must come to the revelation that our lives are not our own. After Paul's conversion, he suffered his entire, surrendered his entire being to, to the Lord, even his identity and his name, so that God may be glorified. This led to Paul's sacrificial suffering. And then his death as a martyr. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 states, Do you know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own, but you were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. In my first sermon, I mentioned that God gives everybody something, but he won't give anybody everything. Paul definitely proves this theory true. 
if we are to become imitators of Christ, the first thing we must understand is that he is love. Be careful who we imitate. We never know who is imitating us. It's so important to be aware of who we are imitating because we never know who we're inspiring. As Christians, we are always under the microscope. The first place to start is in our homes, raising up our families to be Christ-like. In fact, in Ephesians 5, he gives us instructions for a Christian household. Loving our wives as God loves his church, that's his command. And bringing up our children in the knowledge of the Lord. Set an example. Being a husband or wife, they should long to be. <clears throat> Emphasis 5, 21 through 30 is the instructions for a Christian household. <clears throat> Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands, or submit yourself to your husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. His body, which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to the Christ, so also wives submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. To make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and present to her to himself as radiant church, without stain, without wrinkle, or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one has ever hated their own body, but then fed and cared for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. <clears throat> we know from this scripture that husband... The husband is to love his wife like Christ loves the church. We know that wives are supposed to submit to their husbands as the church to God. I think this is the part of the scripture that I was most deluded about. If I really examine the scriptures, I realize that I'm the biggest failure. How could I possibly love my wife like Christ loves the church? We as husbands and wives are supposed to represent God's love for the church. I can tell you that I'm failing. As much as I love my wife, Jesus' love for his church and for his people makes my love for my wife look minuscule. Now I must cry out, Lord, show me how to love my wife. so that I may resemble you as the church, that you be glorified. <clears throat> but love is not just for at home. It's where we start. It is also for the church. When Paul writes, when Paul writing, when Paul writes this letter, the biggest problem he is confronting in the church is a division between the church. They're arguing over who should follow Apollos and who should follow Paul. We are one body. We're called to love each other. 
We're called to be one body. Do we see anything different in our churches today? Do we see the cliques? Do we see the strife, the talking, backbiting? I believe we still do. Nothing is new under the sun. In my first sermon, I talked about cliques in the church. They have been in the church since Paul first set up his churches. Paul is setting up a standard in the church of Corinth. He is coming to them in a spirit of love, in correction. We need to set a new precedence in our church. We need to be able to call out our brothers and sisters when we see something. But we also need to accept the correction when it comes. And we're called to do this in love. If we are truly imitators of Christ, everything, and I mean everything we do, should be in love. We should be set aside from the rest. Everything we have, we've gotten from God. And we owe him everything. We should spend our money differently. We should talk differently. We should walk differently. People should know us by our love. Not conforming to the things of this world, but being transformed in our minds to be Christ-like. This is a quote from Francis Frangipan. It says, If the Jesus you are following or imitating is not leading us to the realm of the the impossible to make changes in your world, you're following the wrong Jesus. We are not called to be like the world. We're called to be set us above Third John says, Dear friends, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is good is from God. Anyone who does what is evil has not seen God. We need to ponder that. We need to examine ourselves. I need to examine myself. What do people see when they look at me? Do they see the world and the things of this world? Or do they see Jesus living in me? My prayer is that they see Jesus living in me. John makes it very simple to understand. There's nothing confusing about his statement. If we do what is good, it is from God. Anyone who does not do what is Anyone who does what is evil has not seen God. And Paul writes in Romans 12, 1 and 2, a living sacrifice. <clears throat> Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. If you notice, we didn't take much time talking about being an imposter. Our bad behavior comes natural. We're born bad. We're raised up to be good. We don't have to be taught to be bad. We need the correction to behave and to be Christ-like. In Hebrews 10, I'm sorry, 13, 10 through 20, it says, We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. The high priest carries the blood of the animals into the most high place as a sin offering. 
but the bodies are burnt outside the camp. And so Jesus also set, suffered outside the city gates to make the people holy through his blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer a good sacrifice of praise. The fruits of the lip that openly profess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others for which sacrifice God has pleased. Have confidence in your leadings in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden. For the world, for that would be of no great benefit to you. Pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and deserve to live honorable in every way. We are called to live a life like Jesus. Jesus came into this world poor. He went through the world, spit on, trampled over, called names. I'm going to challenge you in the same way Pastor Ron challenged you last week. Be willing to go outside the gate. Go where you're not comfortable. Know the calling that God has on your lives and where he wants you. Be willing to suffer as he did. For you, I can guarantee that there's no suffering that's going to come from this world that is any greater than what Jesus suffered for us. We owe Jesus everything. He suffered for you. He suffered for me. He carried the burdens of my sins. Who else could carry that burden? And we're not meant to carry our own burdens because Jesus died for us so that we don't have to. It's not easy to carry the cross. It's heavy. But imagine the cross that had every sin of the world nailed to it. Imagine your father not even being able to look at you because of the sin that you carried. And he was spotless. He was pure. Who do we want to be an imitator of? Are we imitators or are we imposters? Let us pray. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you show us what is right and wrong. Lord, I thank you that you've provided a way, Lord, for us that doesn't include feeling nailed to a cross. Lord, we're called to carry the cross, but we're not called to be nailed to it, Lord. And I thank you for that because that's where we belong. Lord, I just pray that you fill us, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, that we know the difference between right and wrong, imitator or imposter. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you have mercy on us and grace on us, Lord. I thank you that you've called us, Lord. As unworthy as you are, you make us worthy. And it's nothing of our own, Lord. My sins are no better than anyone else's, Lord. You forgive them all, Lord. I pray for a repentant heart, Lord, for myself and for those around me, Lord. I pray, Lord, as I walk through this day, Lord, through this week and through this life, Lord, that you use me as you see fit, Lord. I thank you that you equip the called 
because I'm so inequipped, Lord, to do what you ask us to do, to be an imitator of you. We thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. You are so good, even when we are so bad. We exalt you above all things, Lord. You are good. We just praise you today, Lord, and thank you, Jesus. I'm going to open up the altars to anybody that needs prayer, anybody that wants to come up and praise the Lord for what he's done to them, for intercession. I'm going to call forth our elders and the staff to come forward. If there's anyone that needs prayer, feel free to come up. If there's anyone who hasn't accepted Jesus as their Savior, I encourage you to come forward. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. If you want prayer, come on up now. But there's some things that I'd like to close with to kind of bring it into... Uh, our context to today and today's church and in and the, the way that the way that we do church today as Americans you know last week we had these these fences up here and it represented our walls and the open space is the gate and and we were called to just like Christ leave our city gate leave our protection of our walls and I challenged us at the end to write some of the things down that that we're holding that are kind of like a a faux protection that we put up around us. And there are things I didn't see who wrote these. It doesn't matter who wrote these, but big things like pride, things, feelings like uh, rejection, feelings like depression, uh, feelings like resentment, worldly ways of thinking, fear, pride, lust, um, excuses, um, doubts, control, fear, 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 fear fear, um, moving outside of the boxes, things like that, that we hold on to. We've had a week now. We've had a week now. And so I, what I want to do is, as leading you in this way is over the course of that last seven days, has there been a time where these things have been unwritten and taken back? Um, we've, we were challenged to leave them here and to walk away from them and leave our city of protection, leave what we think we need, what we think we know, and and to go. And so the challenge I want to bring to you is don't leave this place the way you came in. Don't walk out of here the same way that you came in. If, If these things have been resurrected and brought back into your life, resubmit them to the Lord. It's a daily process of submitting it to the Lord. So I'm going to challenge you in that way, and and then we'll conclude. Heavenly Father, Jesus, we thank you so much that, God, we we have the grace that's necessary to walk in ways of righteousness because you have given him. You've given us that, God. You have poured out freely upon us, God. We who didn't deserve anything, you gave it. Lord, and so we recognize as your people that the biggest way to lay down our pride is to understand that we need a Savior. Not that we just needed a Savior at one point in our life, but we every day need a Savior. That daily we need you, Christ, in our lives. So Father, we thank you for the relationship we do have with you. We thank you for the relationship that is available to all who ask. They will receive that that door, when you knock on it, that it'll be opened. You'll come in. You make your home within us so that the things like fears, the things like doubt, the worries, the depression, the worldly ways of thinking, the boxes that we're contained within, the pride, the fear, the discouragement, the pain, the sorrow, all of those things can daily be surrendered over to you, that we can lay them down 
that we can walk away from them knowing they're not our burden to carry, that you carried that burden to the cross. And you died with that burden. And you said it is finished. And so now we have resurrection life to walk into. Jesus, this is who you are. We as your people, we are people to walk in your way. To be known as people of the way. The very ones that the world and its religious ways of thinking said should die. But we, your people, are people of the way. And you are the way, the truth, and the life. So Father, we just give it all to you. We remember you today, God. Jesus, anyone who's carrying that burden, that Lord, they would understand that they have the freedom to give it up. That they have the freedom to walk away from it. That they are not bound to it, but they are free in Christ to leave it at your feet. Give us all strength in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'd like to thank Doug. Give Doug a hand. This was his second sermon, and I thought I thought the biblical truth he pulled out was very well uh, understood. So thank you, Doug, for delivering that to us.